Thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Uh, I'm Stephen Snoddy, the director of the New Art Gallery. It's my pleasure to introduce Richard Long, who needs no introduction, I'm sure. He can introduce me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to have a conversation with Richard, and then at some point I will stop, and we would like the audience to ask any questions uh, about his work or anything that they're, they, they want to discuss in further detail. So I will leave time for you guys to ask Richard questions. Um, just to give you some background, uh, over 20 years ago, I worked in Arnold Feeney in Bristol, and I organized the show of Richard's work in 1990. And so I've known Richard for uh, over 20 years and followed his work, being hugely impressed with uh, the way that, as an artist, he has not followed the celebrity route. Uh, he's got no real connection with the YBAs and can be seen completely outside of that um, milieu, so to speak. Um, and also, I think it's very interesting that Richard was born in Bristol, brought up in Bristol, and still lives in Bristol, which is highly unusual with artists of that, of his international standing, to remain within the town that they were brought up in. So maybe I should just start there, Richard, and do you want to say why that's the case, or? Um, no, maybe it's stupid, but anyway. <laughs> um. Well, it's just very convenient. It's, uh, it's close to the, wh where my mud comes from, for a start. <laughs> close to London as well. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of students here today, and uh, what would be very interesting is if you would just talk about your early experiences at Bristol uh, West of England College of Art, because I think it's very instructive <laughs> for right. the students that are here to hear Richard's story and how, what happened when he went to his local art college? Um, oh, right. <laughs> uh, well, I was a very precocious um, art student and I think my second year I won the painting prize and then a year and a half later they threw me out for being too precocious. Uh, but it, it meant that I could um, start doing in my own work, um, which I had already started to do, find, find my own language. And to cut a long story short, um, I went to London. Uh, I got into St. Martin's in 1966, which just is, so Bristol throwing me out was probably the, be the best break of my whole life. And um, so what happened when you went to St. Martin's? There was a feeling at the time that pop art had wouldn't say peaked, but it was certainly there or thereabouts. Um, Anthony Caro was teaching at St. Martin's. He was the welded steel man. He was a, you know, very good welder. Mm -hmm. uh, abstract expressionism was perhaps slightly distant past, and in, in Britain, certainly, you would only really look at it on the pages of Art Forum. Was there a feeling when you went to St. Martin's that you were within a generation of artists? I mean, the first person that you met there was George from Gilbert yeah. and George, that's actually something was happening, or was it like just one of those? No, no, that's, that's a, you can say all this with, with hindsight, you know, looking back on it. Um, um, but uh, with hindsight, we, we were the generation that had a clean slate. Um, and you could say that I come from a generation where so many things were invented, in like, like minimal art, conceptual art, performance art, um, so it was like in music. It was like the, it was like a definition of the '60s. It was, um, you know, a very imaginative time, especially to be a young student in London. And in terms of um, the way that St Martin's did, they just say, "Here's some um, materials." No, no. So basically, um, why I got in was because I was um, my reputation had preceded me, so I wasn't. I couldn't get into the Royal College and I couldn't get into um, the Central um, or the Slade. Um, so I got into this very unique course called the, the Advanced Sculpture Course, which was um, a, a course for oddballs, and we were allowed to do anything we wanted. We, all we had to do was sign in in the morning and say where we were, you know, like um, 
welding shop or something. And uh, so I just went and worked on the roof for almost two years, you know, m damming, making dams and ponds and sand um, gardens and things. I don't think they'd let you work on the roof anymore? No, probably not. No. Different times. <laughs> and are there people who you were at St. Martin's with that you're still friends with and still... Yeah, well, I was, uh, I, uh, obviously I was the same generation of... Um, Barry Flanagan had just left, but, um, Bruce McLean had just left. Um, Hamish Fulton was a contemporary, George is, as you say, on the next desk, literally, of, of me. Um, so it was, I, I was, I fell into a fantastic peer group. And, and what happened then, because the, the most difficult time for any young art student is the five years after they leave art college, which, you know, the vast majority are not making any work say three years after they mm. leave our college and then it becomes financially very difficult, et cetera. Was there a time when you, you left St. Martin's in 1968, is that right? Mm -hmm. did, did you, were you absolutely clear about what you were gonna do in terms of? Uh, well, well, the short answer is yes. But, um, so I'd already began working outdoors. I, I suppose there was a moment in the mid, when I was in Bristol, um, when, uh, I, I had um, I realised that um, it was more interesting to make art out in the real world, so to speak, than it was in the studio. So I got into St Martin's on the strength of work that I'd already been making in my neighbour's gardens and things like that. The snowball drawing on the downs, um, snowball track. Um, so while I was while I was a student at St Martin's, I, I was already doing like work that was like kind of like very good and became quite famous almost immediately. So, um, so as, as soon as I had, um, as soon as I finished um, my summer term at St. Martin's in 68, I had a show, I had, an ex uh, had a letter to have an exhibition in Dusseldorf in um, like two months later, so. And I did that show in Dusseldorf and um, it coincided with an international show in the Kunsthalle there. So, in my first week in Dusseldorf, I was meeting people like Joseph Boyce and Carl Andre and Panamarenko and um, Daniel Buren doing his stripes. So um, I fell out of the London art world and into a peer group which, in a way, was much more close to the experimental work that I was doing at St. Martin's. And of course, in London at that time, there was no real commercial gallery set up like there is now. I no, I, I didn't. I didn't have a remote commercial sense of that. Um, I could make um, that there was a commercial art world. Um, in fact, uh, I knew I was doing something interesting, like walking these straight lines through fields in England and um, like m making lines of water and everything. Um, but what really surprised me was that I actually came back on the ferry from Dusseldorf um, with two hundred and fifty quid in my pocket from just some sticks that I'd done. That was a sculpture, I just went with a small um, cardboard suitcase, <laughs> it sounds very romantic, but with some sticks. And I made a stick sculpture and, they, and it was sold. So that was, it, was a, it was like a revelation to me that if you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, that somebody, for whatever reason, would, would buy it. And um, so I've been a professional artist ever since then. You know, like one, one work leads to another. And were you aware, well, I mean, that's obviously, but you make your own luck, Richard, don't you? You must have had a feeling yeah. at that well, point. I, I, well, of course, I wouldn't have um, been sort of like embraced, as it were, um, by people like Carl Andre, who was very supportive, if I hadn't had this small tin of photographs in my pocket <laughs> of the work that I've been making in the landscape in England, you know, like the daisies or the land made by walking or the circles in Ireland. Um, that, that, so, the, so the preceding summer, I had gone around Ireland with my three um, concentric circles of wood that I laid in different places, in diff um, so that um, each, um, each, each, every time the three circles were made, they be they became they took up the shape of the place and everything. So um, th that's just so I had this body of work to show people, even in bars. Um, so like when I went to, and then Carl Andre said, "Well, you must come." Obviously, you must come to New York. So I was in a bar in New York, my first week in New York, and I was showing this, these same photographs of the works from England to a, to a, um, 
and, and, and a man said, oh, well, that's, they're amazing photographs, I'm a gallerist, I'll give you a show in one week. So we took these photographs to this shop that made like typical 60s blow-ups of like Jimi Hendrix or like pop, pop posters and I, um, made these blow-ups from my little chemist photographs and I had my first show in New York. Well, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the gallery in New York? John Gibson. Right, it doesn't look, it's not around anymore, is it? I think, well, I think is he's still alive, but doing up to something, yeah. And, and what was the... But, I mean, also, another weird, if you want, another anecdote from, the, from that time in Dusseldorf. So, so after my show in September in 68, um, I, I had a young artist, no rep, I had nothing to do, so Conrad Fisher, he said, why don't, there's this festival down in Italy, why don't you get on a train um, and go down to this... Um, festival of which was the manifestation of Arte Povera, um, the Italian um, group, and I'd never heard of them. So like two days later I got off the train in Naples and got picked up by this sort of odd motley collection of, uh, it's like joining a circus, and that, so that was my introduction to the world of uh, Arte Povera artists. So within and, a and, I, and I would say that, um, again, you know, they really um, sort of appreciated what I'd been doing in England and um, so again, I've just, so I, I would say that my, my, all, all my first um, luck, um, happenstance, um, contacts in the art world came from you know, fellow artists. But that, the, the other thing that, I mean, the, I, I suspect, and I might be totally wrong, but I suspect that you're a really nice guy, Richard. You're quite English, to me anyway, because I'm not English. Mm -hmm. but, and I think they thought, actually, the Italians, the Americans, they thought, we like this guy, this guy, you know, I mean, but on, a, on a purely personal level, you know, they're thinking, um, you were using the materials at the Art Provera, poor materials, mm -hmm. found materials. There was nothing ostentatious about your work, which there wasn't in the Italian Art Provera movement. And I think from a, they, they, they've just took you in. And I think it's absolutely amazing that, um, within a very short space of time after having left St. Martin's that you were building, um, as you say, almost by happen chance, this career mm. in terms mm. of um, um, showing yeah. in galleries. Um, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I have to bear in mind that the art world in those days was very a very small art world, but it, it was international. So that one year later, there was this... Um, big important group show in, in Bern, in Switzerland, when attitudes become form. Um, so I just, for that I made a walk in the Alps, and that was my first text work. So, um, and then there was a big international show in the Guggenheim Museum. So like one thing led to another, but it, it, was, um, it was a small world, but it was completely international in those days. And then what happened, wh when were you taken up in, in London? When did that, when did that happen? And um, well, he's, he's here tonight. I, 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 <laughs> I walked into the Listen Gallery and I said, Nicholas Longstell, I'm Richard Long, you, know, I, you should give me a show. And he said, of course I should. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nicholas. Oh, that's all right, name check. That was preceded by a postcard the day before. Oh. So good morning, Nicholas. Richard Long. Right, there you are. The show goes on. <laughs> but also, I should say that... that, that Nicholas um, Logsdale of the Listen Gallery, I mean, you were one of the first galleries to, to start showing contemporary art in London, and thank goodness you're still around, and mm -hmm. if I may say so, Nicholas, I think you have a great reputation of working with artists. You know, you're an artist gallery, if you know what I mean. Uh, if, if yeah, yeah, no, you're not that's a very corporate. good point. You're not a corporate, you don't have seven galleries across the world, uh, and you're not, you've not got... <laughs> <laughs> What I mean is, I think you've kept your soul, if that's the right way of saying it. I think that, I think that the, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to Please do. <laughs> I came, I, I also started when I was a contemporary critic, and I, I, I always said that in those days, I went to the wrong artist, and I went to the play, because there is a lot of play. I got it, and he didn't. He got it, and I was more interesting. But we didn't know that at the time. All oh, right, okay. So Yeah, I applied for the slate. I didn't get in. <laughs> I applied for Chelsea College of Art and didn't. I had an interview there, but didn't get in. And I studied in Belfast College of Art. 
Look what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a if you have a determination, which I think Richard has obviously shown in the mm -hmm. early right. years, and you have a, something within your core that you believe is innate within yourself, and I think because I lived in Bristol for four years, and I sort of know the Bristol vibe, and I can see exactly why the work has come out of Richard and why he still lives in Bristol, which I think is fabulous. Um, if, if we can sort of move on a little bit. How do you decide what you're going to do next? I mean, do um, I can't imagine <clears throat> you being super, super like, you know, no, no. I'm going to go to Russia in three weeks' time and then... No, no. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, for every different reason under the sun, you know, I, I make... Because <clears throat> obviously, a life, being an artist, is all about making decisions, you know. What I choose to show you in this show is, is the decisions I made about when people asked me to make a print. Um, I've done this wall behind um, because you've decided to have an exhibition of mine here and you can say, you know, please use this wall. So I often say if somebody gives me a, a beautiful wall, I can make a beautiful work. Um, but I, I, I don't... Um, so in terms of the walks and the landscapes, uh, again, all different reasons. Um, you know, I went to central. I went to Zambia and Malawi many years ago because my brother happened to be running a food um, station there. Or um, I went to the Antarctic recently because um, another artist in my gallery at the time had been there, and there was a sort of organisation to help me get to the Antarctic. So, um, so I'm, I'm basically an opportunist, and whatever. Um, I don't have to work very hard for. Um, <laughs> people to give me opportunities to do things. So there's, um, so in terms of um, what are you, where are you traveling next, for instance? Well, my, my, I'm, I'm doing a, a big walk in Spain um, just after Easter. Um, so that's, and that's really, um, some walks are, are completely my own ideas. And um, well, most of the walks are actually, you know, I have, I have just a completely unique original idea to make a walk for a particular reason, and the trick is to have enough time in my life to be able to go and do it. So, so you decide to go to Spain. Do you know when you you know where you're going to start? Yeah. Do you know where you're going to finish? Yeah, and that's part of the whole point of the walk. Yeah. Right. Uh, in this case. But do you know what you're going to do between A and B? Uh, no, I don't. But I know the routes. You know, because in that instance, it's, it's a long road walk. I will buy maps and I will measure the distance. And um, um, so that's a very so a long road walk is very well planned. You know, it's like I know or I hope it's going to take 18 days and all that blah blah blah. Roughly the distance. Whereas other walks. Um, like I did a, a walk in the in the Alps last summer, which was a much more um, off the cuff, random walk. Um, so, so a wilderness walk is a completely different um, way of walking than like doing a road walk. It's much more um, intuitive, or um, uh, it's more in a way. It's, it's just different. Even even the you know different type of rucksack, different boots. Um, I take all my own food. All that's uh, you know. And do you ever invite anybody to go with you on the walk? No, but no, no. I mean, a great luxury about me doing the walks is that I can do them alone. You know, so the, the solitude and the um, being able to work in these like sort of beautiful places completely on my own is is, is kind of part of the whole work, really. Especially you know making the sculptures in these great places. And have you come across, um, you make, make a stone circle, say, somewhere in the wilderness. Mm. What happens if, you, if somebody comes across you making the sculpture? Do, do they know you're making art or do they just think no, you're... No, no, I mean, it, it doesn't happen very often because yeah. um, I'm usually like really isolated. But um, occasionally just like some local um, herdsman or tribesman would just walk by and they'll will pass the time of day, but he, he, they won't see what I'm doing, really, or they won't recognise it as art, which, which suits me fine. I, um, I, I, 
or, or um, some days later, might a, a, a local person might pass and see a circle of stones, but they won't. They they'll see it as a circle of stones made by someone. It's a human mark, but they won't know it's like a work of art by a modern artist. Um, so, so it, it interests me that uh, I can I have the uh, the freedom to make art and put it in the world in all so many different ways. So when you're on your walk, how have you already constructed in your mind this is going to be a tax work? Uh, well, again, it's like on that particular walk, I had a preconceived tax work in my mind. So I was thinking of a various um, pattern of words and um, that I was going to make a tax work. But the similar t at the same time, along the walk, I was finding places by chance to make sculptures, and at which I and I and I couldn't have foreseen those works. So. so I can work completely off the cuff by chance at, and at the same time as doing a preconceived tax work. It, it seems that you have an abs absolute freedom to do what you want to do. And I would imagine, I might be wrong here, but I imagine you don't have what you might constitute an artist studio. You don't have assistance. Um, no, I'm a bit odd like that. I don't, I, I don't have... You don't a need PA. a studio, do you? Because your studio. I certainly don't need a studio, but but uh, but that, that's not to say that I have this like lead this poetic life of just <laughs> roaming the world, you know, like a like an artistic nomad. I mean, I, I do a lot of um, work when I'm in England, just like writing letters and um, you know, or designing catalogues, or just the just the bits and pieces of um, organizing my life, like anyone. Yeah. Okay. Um. You mentioned in a conversation a couple of days ago that y you quite like music. You do you, I'm assuming you don't play music when you're on your walks because you want the solitary... Um, no, I don't, no. N neither do I take books because they're too heavy. And I think, I mean, if, if I'm making a walk, I like to be in the here and now. So to be reading a book about somewhere else or to, um, or to have music from... Actu actually, li re physical music in earphones would be... A distraction. Well, I but, think I mean, but uh, okay. So uh, I did a, a walk in Ireland a few years ago, actually called Walking Music. Where it was deliberately that the the idea was to um, think about one piece of music in my head each day as I was walking along, like one carries a, a tune in one's head. But that that was different from actually having earphones. I I also think what's um which sort of struck me over the last few days when we were putting the show up, is that, um, and I was looking at an art magazine the other day, and there was a picture of um, the Anish Kapoor's Helter Skelter thing at the London Olympics. And I just thought... <laughs> is that, that the is, title? I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's like a Helter Skelter, isn't it? What's it called again? Orbit. Orbit, yeah, of course, mm. yeah. And I just thought, actually, I much prefer the quiet this of your work, you know, because mm. you're not a monumental no, artist. No, I mean, I have to say that, no. I'm, I'm not interested in monumental work, but that's just my preference. I really like the idea of making something from nothing, which is, in a way, exactly what the line made by walking is. Um, so, but it's, it's also important only to me, not to another. Another, uh, and he can, d you know, what he does what's right for him. And my preference is always to make... Like, like the work behind me, it's made with my hands because it's a real pleasure to chuck mud on the, w on the wall. Um, the stones are placed by me, um, the, the walks are made obviously but with my footsteps. Um, so ev everything is mediated through my body. Okay. And yeah, I, I, I mean, the American land artists were um, monumental in the sense that they. Um, constructed vast works with machinery and diggers and everything and they had to buy the land and you know to own it to be able to do all that stuff um, but I think to walk like a thousand miles which is actually much bigger in scale is, is, is again a kind of freedom uh, and uh, I can just do it by walking well you did walk over a thousand miles did you Probably yeah mm. in 30 days so that yeah, you yeah. walked over 30 miles a day yeah mm. I mean which is not well it's well it's something, yeah, yeah. D <laughs> I don't do that often. But no, <laughs> no. Um, 
So you've obviously planned that, but if we talk about that particular, what, 1,000 miles in 30 days, over 30 miles mm. a day. Yeah. Is there a point like if you run the marathon and you hit the wall? Or is there no, no, because it's accumulative, you know, so the first few days you get sore feet and then the great thing about doing a long walk is that you sort of like get fitter. So you, uh, one has a sense of well-being. Um, that, uh, so you have painful days and everything, but uh, overall it's, um, it, it sort of ends up by being a pleasure. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, one thing to say about these road walks, which um, you, you probably know through my work, sometimes I'll put a stone on the road. Um, so each stone, a, a road, uh, each day, a stone put on the road. Um, those stones are still out there in the world somewhere. So um, if, you, if you put all those stones together, it becomes like a big object, but because they're spaced out, um, you only know about what I've done through the story I tell you. Well, I'm telling you the story now, or you might read about it in a text work. Um, but those stones are out there in the world, and um, they'll probably exist for another, you know, thousands and thousands of years, except they just won't be recognized as art. So you only know about that they might be part of an artwork through the story I tell you about them. Well, it's interesting you say that, because it, I'd forgotten about this, and uh, in 1980, when I was at our college, there was four of us went to the Aran, the Irish Aran Islands, not the Scottish ones, for a few days to um, just to do some painting and drawing. And um, you could only get there by, there's only two boats a week, so you knew you were there for three or four days. And um, I will actually go back there at some point um, because I remember getting a very flat stone and a very round pebble and putting one on top of the other and putting it behind a gate. And I know exactly where it'll be because it's a very small island. And one day I will go back and see if my sculpture is still there. Um, yeah, it was a, 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 a wonderful trip. And I think quite a lot of the work, um, you know, particularly the Irish work here and other works, have actually brought me back to a lot of thing, memories that I had actually forgotten about. Um, it also made me think about uh, my career, if you like, from 1987, from Arnold Feeney onwards, is directly related or at the same simultaneous time as the YBAs. And yet when I look at the artists who I really respond to, actually a lot of them are more about nature than um, the YBAs are. And I think it's fascinating for an exhibition like this for, for me personally to have taken on some of the things and um, actually reflect a lot more about the type of art I'm really interested in and, you know, um, thinking about things that I hadn't thought about for a while. Well, I mean, it's wonderful to hear you talk about the work. I think um, when you're out over the next few days over Easter and you go for a walk in the country, I'm sure people will be thinking about the show, thinking about what Richard said, um, looking at the power of nature, understanding the materials, the environment in which we're in. And I think really, um, over the last 50 years, Rich, Richard, that you've really brought uh, a poetry to art and to um, work that's been made in this country for many, many years. And it's much more resonant looking at the work in this show than a lot of the work that's splashed all over the newspapers. So I think it's fantastic that you've done the show here. Um, absolutely delighted. Um, you've been a pleasure to work with and it's been great having a conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.